you know, I should set this up better. You think at this point in my life I'd had this set up slightly better? Yet somehow, here I am. All right, there you are. All right, so now I believe you're officially in. Look at that. Oh my gosh, look it's, at that. It's Greg from Leptos. It's my face. It's all hey, Greg. <laughs> do you ever get that joke? I did. Does anyone I ever love it? You? Okay, you do. Oh, absolutely. I was like 15, right, when that came out. So it was a classic of my middle school or experience or whatever, early high school. I don't know when that was. But... <laughs> yeah, 15 is definitely oh, not middle school. <laughs> you ever drink Bailey's from a shoe? <laughs> <laughs> what you doing in my waters, boy? Uh, that's great. I'm happy you know that. I would actually be genuinely sad if you're just like, who's old Greg? I'd be like, oh, Gregory. Well, you gotta That'd be, be like so this. sad. That'd be so sad. Yeah, you can't be named Greg and have existed in like the mid two thousands or whatever that was, and not not know that one. But okay, is that the same thing <sighs> as having uh, if you're named Aaron and getting A A Ron? Is there like these cultural oh movements <laughs> like where you're just like, well, I guess this is because I, I got and his name is Robert Paulson, nonstop because of a uh, Fight Club. So when I was oh. young, every dude like when I was like. 10, 11 years old, every guy that was 18 is like, and his name is Robert Paulson. And I was just like, I don't even get the joke. What are we talking about? <laughs> That's not your name. I know my name's what not Robert name? Paulson, but it's close enough. It's my last name, Paulson. So I know. So it's close enough. Uh, anyways, hey. All right, Greg. So, hey, Gregory. So I don't know if you've seen this idea of Prime Stack, by the way. Uh, it's, yes, Pastor, it's Pastor Greg. Yeah, so you're an Episcopal pastor? How does, okay, so can I can I just ask how does that work out or priest? How yep. do you manage to have time to develop an amazing UI framework? I assume you work full time. I do not. So that's a big part of it. So I actually, um, okay. I you know I basically grew up from the time I was a kid, like probably a lot of people here, um, just kind of hacking away on stuff in my in my spare time, um, just like little hobby projects and stuff as a kid. Um, and I basically as an adult. Um, I'd worked on some kind of church related apps, like when I was uh, in seminary and then when I was serving in a church and I was working in a church full time, like 2018, 2019. Um, and then during the pandemic, basically one digital thing that I had made really took off because a lot of people were using it for like online worship and yeah. being shut down. Okay. Um, and then basically the next church I went to was actually looking for somebody like part time. So I'm the, the pastor here and I'm like 60% time at the church and I do some freelance um, web development stuff okay. that, you know, um, pays better than nonprofit work right so it kind of filled in the salary pretty well um but then yeah i mean i basically um i did not anticipate adding like open source maintainer to that um which is rewarding in its own way but not so much with the with the cash um yeah. but it's been really fun just to to build up a little community and stuff and i don't know they're kind of overlapping skills right like working with a bunch of cantankerous people who like sometimes get um into big fights over pretty obscure stuff is like a pretty good description <laughs> of open is source, open and source also or church? church so yeah yeah, yeah. same, That's same, actually same a really thing funny joke yeah yeah yeah, yeah i'm, I'm, yeah, I'm so assuming grand. bike shedding was originally done thousands of years ago at this point the the original yeah, let me bike tell you about the council of nicaea and 325 a yeah <laughs> A lot, lot, lot of that. Yep, lot all right. Of that. Well, I don't have that level of knowledge, so <laughs> I can't. I can't even paint the bike shed at this point. Um. All right. So oh, that's excellent. So you've been developing Leptos now for a while, right? And Leptos is uh pretty fiery. People really like it. Yeah, it's been pretty cool. I the the first the first like directory on my computer that's called Leptos is probably almost two years old at this point. Um, but the current version I really started working on and maybe maybe June or July of this year. So not actually that um, recently, but I had been through pretty much every iteration of what you can do with like Rust, Wasm, UI. Uh, I just named them all the same thing, but none of them were, were public at all. Um, so it's been, you know, really just the last few months. And I think it was September. I made the you know repository public and all of that. So it's been pretty busy four or five months, uh, really. Okay. And so just for everybody that doesn't know Rust, Leptos, uh, Leptos is a UI library, much like SolidJS. Is it fair to say it's much like yeah, it's fair to say that, like, in a lot of ways, it's almost a port of Solid. So a lot of the APIs have identical names, work in very similar ways. It's a little less, um, it's, a, it's a lot more like Baby's first reactive system, but it is pretty much API compatible in a lot of ways, just um, in the sense that I was, like, the router, for example, um, I pretty much line by line ported Solid router. And stuff has changed over time, but it's really nice to use a very similar mental model because then it means it's really easy to implement a lot of the same ideas. Okay. Okay, and then... Uh... One one more one more question on this whole Leptos thing the the naming right 
Everyone yeah, always yeah. does leptospirosis. So obviously, I don't think you thought of the disease at this. I think you even told me once what you named it after. What is leptos named after? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's an ancient Greek word, which means like thin or light or um, actually, I guess, fine grained, um, which I learned more recently. Um, and so it kind of it's that idea of like this thin layer of something that's connecting different parts of your application. Um, I apparently leptospirosis is a thing. I didn't know that it existed when I came up with this name. I think it comes from the same Greek word, like a lot of medical kind of terms. Um, so, you know, sorry for any, any dog owners. People sometimes are like, it's really disturbing when I Google this. And when I Google it, of course, it just shows up as all stuff about the framework <laughs> because it's like personalized and whatever. Um, but people who have dogs are like, yeah, I get a lot of kind of gross looking stuff. Um, so I'm sorry about that, everybody. I'm probably not going to change the name. That's my bad, you know? That's actually... That's actually really, really funny. I never even thought about it because when I search it up, I also just get Rust libraries, right? Because I'm frequently searching up Rust. Uh, obviously, yeah. Google yeah. knows me at this point. And so, yeah. you know, I have dogs. I just, I, I don't search up anything to do with dogs. I don't, you know, my dogs are not my babies. They are just dogs I throw a ball for and I enjoy having around. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. that probably explains it. Okay, that's... <laughs> uh, yes, that is also, by the way, the most nerdy thing ever to name it after a nice arcane Greek reference and be like, well, yeah, I mean, well mm, actually, did you know? It's actually super great though, right? Because if you name your thing like fast, Dom or whatever <laughs> crap, people name their things like blazing thing. <laughs> like all that stuff is taken on crates.io. Like I, I've had no problem getting crate names, you know, repository names, GitHub organization domains. Cause like the only other thing called leptos is a, is a, um, a real disease. estate company in Cyprus. Oh. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that too. And then a disease. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, my general strategy has been for like getting names and everything is I let Twitter choose the name. So I have like Orgwasm, uh, Titty Sprinkles. You know, I just got like the best names possible that the internet can come up with. So. Man of God. Bad for my <laughs> <Yeah>. professional life. <laughs> <Yeah>. Probably doesn't <laughs> reflect very well at church. They're like, hey, what are you working on? I'm working on Titty Sprinkles. Have you heard of it? It's actually named after pot. <laughs> People are like, what? Amazing. <laughs> what? I don't get it. <laughs> All right, uh, oh, Bun Spreader was by far the most uh, best named nice. one. Nice. Nice. Oh, gosh, I can't believe that happened. Anyways, uh, name it after uh, graphic diseases. Yeah, <laughs> that's your Well, tip. okay, so, right, you think about it, though, right? And then there's <laughs> there's all this stuff in Rust because there's, the like, the crab, right? Um, and this, like, crab logo. And what is a crab in Latin is, like, cancer, whatever. So there's all this stuff in, like, carcinization is, like, making a thing more rusty. And it's like, guys, you got to not do this, like, Let's just like back away from the like cancer. I know it's cancer, like the uh, uh, what's it called? Um, zodiac symbol or whatever, but like, yeah, so you know, yeah, fair enough. I will make a donation if somebody finds like a leptospirosis fund fighting the disease, I will make a donation to them. That, that's so a, that's a the pretty chat. big that's a pretty big move right there. We find yeah. leptospirosisonline.org. I don't see them in here trying to do a charity stream, you know, you know but the, the American Leptospirosis Association, if they, if they come in, we'll, we'll do something. <laughs> if the ALA comes in, we're, re we're yeah, here. Yeah. We're ready. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll make it now. All right. All right. So I did have some questions. So I'm playing around with this, yeah. this whole idea of making something that's serverless, uh, uses, uh, uses Leptos. Uh, I, I have Tailwind effectively. Tailwind was really easy, right? All you got to do is just here's the files and it kind of just can guess its way into making it work out correctly. And mm -hmm. I, right now it's Cloudflare. Cloudflare seems to be the most supported just in general. Uh, Fermion actually reached out. I actually got to meet with somebody and they said they really want to make it work out as well for Fermion. So they're actively working on it right now as well. So I think that's pretty exciting, but I'm now addressing routes, routes in serverless land. Now there's a lot of ways I'm, my brain is already running, right? There's like the manual way, which is theoretically you could just define some simple controller that you pass in every function you want that is a route and it could be some sort of procedural macro that generates what it what its route is right so kind of like how you do actics today which is you have like a this is a get slash whatever and then inside of your actual actics router you're handing it each one of the you know the paths which doesn't necessarily feel as cool uh the second one is obviously uh having some sort of configuration based slash fa uh, file based routing which does seem to be a little bit better but again, that leads to the fact that the main file has to be generated. And always a little worried about generation of code. At least I assume it has to be generated. I'm not sure if procedural macros can read 
from files and then take that, you know, take the code and import things correctly and, and do all that. That sounds a little, uh, you know, that sounds like a lot. I haven't, you know, investigated them enough. And so that means either I'm doing something like that, doing the first option, or there's options I simply don't know about. And I know you've done a lot with the Leptos router, and I know that has a lot to do with some level of routing, though I don't quite understand it. And so I would just love it if you could just like talk to us about what does routing look like in your in your view. And if you were to make this, what would be your preferred version of routing? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess the first thing that I would say is if you think about it, um, start just thinking on like a client side app, right? Um, what is client side routing really doing? And the question is, it's, it's basically taking the URL and like the last part of the URL, the path and the query string, and it's deciding which components to show. So like there's no magic there. It is just an ordinary component. You yeah. could implement your own router in user land. And it's actually part of why like the router package is separate because it's it's all implemented in user land in a, in a sense, right? Like you could create your own router using the stuff that's in the framework core. Um, and so what it does is it just says like, okay, at any, any given point, there's basically a signal. Here's the current URL. And then it um, it matches that against you know, some paths that you've defined and then it decides what to show on the page. And we use like a nested routing thing, kind of like um, if people are familiar with Remix nested routing, I think they're adding it or they just added it in, in Next maybe. Um, SolidJS does this, but where different parts of your path can correspond to like different parts of the page. So mm. you can change a path and just, you know, the classic example is like an invoice page. So it's like, oh, slash invoices. And then it shows like, you know, you've got your menu up here that's on every page. You've got your list of invoices that's just on the invoice page. You click one and it's the invoice here. Um, but when you change to another one, you're routing into a different URL, but it obviously doesn't swap out the whole page. It just does this one little route, you know? So we have that kind of nested routing structure. Um, so if you look at any of the examples that use routing, that's what's in that like routes component. So we have this routes component and then nested within that there are route components. And those can have their own children and stuff, right? And it creates basically this tree of here are all the possible routes that we could match. And then that just manages the routes thing, just manages what to actually render um, based on the URL. So when you do that, and that's all on the client side, like that all just works on the client side, um, fine. And then when you do it on the server, you kind of have to decide, um, it can work like this. You can say, Leptos, just take my URL and I'm gonna literally hand it a string that's like the path. So when a get request comes in anywhere, Leptos deal with it, and you you pass in this one context object that tells it what the path is, it parses it out, it'll render the stuff um, to HTML, and you're good to go. Um, but you can also do something that's like a little more um, specific where it says, you know, what are all the, um, uh, what are all the possible routes that we could match? And then the server only handles those particular ones. Um, so that was kind of like a very, very high level, um, obviously. But so basically on, on the, the question, right, which is like, how do you generate those routes? You could do file system based routing if you wanted to. Um, I don't particularly like it, so I haven't done any work on it, but the router is set up so that that routes component takes like a route definition Mm -hmm. And I usually, you know, you generate the route definition using a route component, but you could generate it, um, you know, by walking over your whole file system tree and defining routes like file system routing any other system, and then just pass that thing into the routes. Yep. And so like Leptos router routes can still handle the actual routing, but you can do the route definition however you want, um, either with the route component or by passing it like a route definition struct and then obviously you can generate that struct. Um, like I don't think a proc macro would work. I do think having something in Cargo Prime Stack running that's watching your directory tree that generates that and puts it in a generated file, that could work. Um, so quick question, why, why don't you like file-based routing? That seems to be a pretty hot thing that people are really into as of right now. What, what yeah, is I, your big argument against it? I mean, I can understand the pros, right? Which are like, all I have to do to add a route is add a file. I don't have to also add something somewhere else. Yep. I've just never seen an implementation of it that doesn't look horrible once you get like three or four pages in or a couple levels nested. 
Um, cause so many of them, like every single file ends up being named index.tsx or whatever, or there are these weird syntaxes. Like I, as someone who, you know, not being super familiar with SvelteKit or Next or whatever, I feel like I can look at config based routing or like component based routing and understand what the structure is supposed to be. But if I see like a screenshot of somebody's directory tree with this file system routing, I don't feel like I can look at it and understand what, <laughs> how it works without some more knowledge of the framework. Um, so that's, it's just like a personal aesthetic thing, but you know, the router is set up so it's possible. I think in Rust, it's also tricky because in JavaScript, the file system and the module tree are pretty closely linked. So like you can import something from a file path kind of, um, and because Rust, that's not totally how it works. I think it's a little trickier too, um, but I don't think it's like undoable. Yeah, no, I mean, I personally, anytime people put additional meaning on things that aren't supposed to have meaning, I always take a step back and go, is this a good idea? So for example, if you haven't seen the last couple of tweets, I say null was a mistake. The reason being is people try to put additional meaning on top of what null means, right? Like, oh, it also means that I have intentionally intended it to be empty, right? And so it's just like now you're playing the game of intentions, which is just, it's always a hard thing to do. And so when I look at some of these file-based routing, it's just like, what does underscore mean? Why is it surrounded with brackets? Now I had to learn like a whole new, very simple DSL to understand what is happening on that page. And I do find that's uh, I find it a little bit hard. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't know if I like that. Like something inside of me says, hey, this is probably not the right place to optimize, but what's wrong with it? I can't quite tell you what's the thing that's wrong with it. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just know something's wrong with it. I can see it. Just like when I see someone using null intentionally, I'm like, why, why are we doing this? What can we do differently? You know, it's negative one all over again. Yep, yep. All right. So if you were to do this, what, what do you think your preferred approach would be? Yeah, so I actually, um, and I put this in the in our private chat if you want to look at it at any point, um, but I put like, I've been working on a little draft kind of Cloudflare integration. And so we have these Actix and Axum integrations. And what those do is basically to let you um, go into the router for those servers and say literally like, um, you know, it's like router, new, whatever, you add any other routes you want, dot leptose routes, and then you can kind of mount your app at a particular point and it generates, it actually runs the app once, um, pulls out here are all the routes that Leptos can handle. And then it has the server handle all of those. Um, and it's a way of basically like connecting the Leptos router into the, the native router. Um, so if I were, you know, if I were you, if I were trying to do this, I would say something like that. And Cloudflare, it's actually lucky because the, the Cloudflare worker router um, accepts really similar patterns to the Leptos router. So if you look at their like examples that use the cloud for a worker router, um, they take like, like say I wanted, you know, um, slash users slash colon ID. And that's like a param that then I have access to ID. It's the exact same thing in, in Leptos. Like I think the, the syntaxes are exactly the same. So it's really easy to map them like one to one. Um, and then, yeah, you just have Leptos take over, render it, return the HTML. Um, and there's like slightly more complex stuff that you need to get into for like streaming HTML and for handling server functions and stuff. And that's why we package them up in these integrations so that you don't have to write all the boilerplate yourself. Um, but like, that's what I would probably do, right? Let people define the routes in that routes component. Um, and then, you know, there's just this very short, like I think I, I put together quick demo the other night and it was something like four lines of code for the user to to connect it like it's not a big amount of boilerplate um and then it also means that you can swap it out between different providers so it makes it like i really like things that are kind of modular and composable and separate from one another so you can write your whole app in one place and then if you're like ah you know cloudflare workers actually aren't working for me anymore i want to switch to axum you can just switch it out for the axum integration instead um and then build a server um so that's kind of what I like doing, but you know, then again, you can, you can generate the routes with the CLI tool or whatever you want. It's not, there, there are very few opinions, right? Um, you mean there's there a lot of opinions. opinions? Well, right. I'm sorry. I, I want the framework okay. to have very few opinions, right? So that your opinions can be how you do things, not my opinions. Cause my opinions might not be very good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I can definitely see that. Uh, I mean, 
So when I think of the file-based routing, one thing I think about is any simple application. Like if I were to build, like even if I were to build, say, a uh, a simple Rust website that does just say one thing pretty well, there might be three, four screens, like that makes it really easy, right? There's not a lot to it. If I were to build Netflix, though, I think I think it would be difficult. Uh, I think that it would be pretty hard to really do a Netflix experience well with file-based routing. Uh, and so I always have this problem, which is like there's it, it almost feels like there's kind of two audiences here. There's the more like prolific user, the one that's going to be doing the more complicated items. And then there's the person that's like, I just want a blog, right? I just want something I can just like throw down some markdown files into a folder and bob bomb. I just have like a working thing. And so that's why, I mean, that's why I still like Astro. I, you know, I'm not a big JavaScript guy, but I feel like Astro is just like, it's just such a, this is the thing I would use if I make a blog because it is just yeah. that. It is exactly that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. All right. It's like perfect. It's like totally perfect for that. And and that's really like a right tool for the job question, right? I mean, nobody, I, people ask, um, I don't want to hurt this person's feelings, but I think they popped into Discord, asked one question and left. But like somebody came in and asked, um, hey, I'm trying to figure out if I should use Leptose or Solid. And, you know, Ben uh, uh, asked him like, well, what's your use case? And he's like, well, I want to use it for my e-commerce startup. And it was like, okay, this is a great example of... Um, picking the right tool for the job. Like if you're building an e-commerce startup, I would not recommend that you use a four month old open source library <laughs> using WebAssembly <laughs> yep. to, to build your company on, right? And then be relying on me fixing bugs in my spare time because uh, your thing is broken in prod. Just like, don't do that. Like pick the right tool. If you're building a blog, like if you love Rust and you want, and you don't care, you know, and you want to use Leptos for your blog, like cool. But like Astro is, a great tool. There are a lot of great tools for blogs. Like, just use the right thing, right? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I do read chat while we're doing this, but yeah, someone yeah. said it's a perfect example of someone who should not build an e-commerce startup. <laughs> if you're coming into my Discord to ask technology questions, um, reconsider that startup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, my my buddy is now he he just got he's he's onto his like his third or fourth e-commerce startup, and this one's actually fairly successful. It's uh. A publicly traded company is like a subsidiary or a you know kind of like the siemens group all those people that do these huge conglomerations uh he's one of the small ones and his answer to this is use wordpress if you're going to build an e-commerce thing build plugins make money there it's a hundred times simpler and people you could i mean there's just like a million and a half businesses you know leftos is not it's not just the wrong language but it's like really you might even be fully wrong in just the idea, the premise of it all. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, use WordPress. yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But that's like the thing with open source, right? Is that people should be having fun. Like if they're not having fun with what they're doing with with side projects or whatever, you know, that's going to be a huge problem. If you're doing it for work, if you're like, I want to make money, yeah. I need to get a solid job. Like, yeah, be a WordPress dev, be a be a React yeah. dev, whatever, right? But if you want to like grow and learn and have fun, do whatever you want, but don't confuse those two things, right? I think that's really important. Um, I use, I mean, I, people, people may have seen me if, if anyone's on like Ryan's stream, I'm in there sometimes Ryan Carniato of solid. And like, I'll say like, I maintain several angular apps because like, yeah, it's great. I mean, I don't have to do anything They're They're year after year. I can just keep up, updating angular and it's awesome. Right? Like you don't have, nothing breaks, you know, it's, it's like sweet, right? I, I get paid to good money to do angular apps and like, that's fine. Right? Like it's, just know your audience and do your, do your work and. Um, and get it done, but like, yeah, le learn and grow and have fun with side projects. And we do have a couple of people who are using Leptos for some work stuff now, but they are, um, they are people who are willing to contribute and who have become really core contributors. I think that's really important with with young open source projects. Yeah, yeah, you have to. If if I mean, the hard part is creating anything without more people helping. Yeah, it just it can't. It's it's non sustainable. Uh, unless if you have like the extremely fortunate situation of like Rich Harris or somebody that you're, it's your full-time job, but even then it's still not that maintainable because you'll just, you'll never get past the stage of answering questions. It's like, you gotta have, it's fairly distributed work. All right. So exactly. I like, I like, I like what you said. I'm going to definitely go investigate some of those because that was kind of like the two things I was thinking about, which is like, all right, it sounds like, like, it sounds like I may be generating routes like that might be that might be the plan here but i also do like this leptos router thing is there any dangers in it anything that you see that uh what what isn't it good at 
Yeah, well, I'll tell you something that Leptos is really not good at right now, which um, came up this week for somebody. Um, so we do this. Um, so because we use like resources, if anyone owns solid, there's this create resource primitive. Leptos does the same thing, mm -hmm. which is like a fine grained async primitive. So if you want to load, um, do like a fetch request, right? You'll stick it inside this and it synchronizes like an async thing with the reactive system, which is all synchronous. And then it's really cool if you're building an app, we actually, if you're doing the um, server side and client side, it will start loading that on the server and stream it down to the client. So it's almost like if you're doing a fetch request or a database thing um, to an API, whatever, it's almost like a promise that starts loading on the server and resolves in the browser, which means it's super fast. And we do the same exact thing for HTML that's in a suspense component like it will render the fallback initially, and then it will actually send the HTML down from the server to the client when it's ready and swap it in. Mm -hmm. So you'll actually often sometimes see the full HTML like before the JavaScript and WASM have even finished loading because your request started on the server. It's really cool. Um, the big problem is that because it's this like out of order streaming, you've already sent most of the page. So things like errors and things like... Um, metadata so like meta tags with stuff that facebook uses or discord uses or whatever for generating their nice little previews is um it's too late to to send those basically and they don't detect them so we've actually had some problems where somebody was like wait a second facebook isn't seeing any of my stuff and it's in the dom and it's like yeah it's it's because we've already sent down in order to get this really fast first load you sacrifice you know you, you send the thing down so i'm going to do some work upcoming on just like better async rendering like that but if you have a page that's really based on um, asynchronous data where your goal isn't just to like show it really fast on the page. Um, I, so I guess like for content sites, right? That that's kind of a weakness right now. Um, if you're just trying to like do like a, if it could have been written in PHP 15 years ago, right? If it's like someone asks for article, go to SQL database to get article, render article to HTML, return it. That kind of stuff you can do, but there are some downsides um, because it's this like finer grained approach for the async stuff. Um, but again, like that's something that you know we can work on. That's kind of the biggest one right now. Um, and then of course, I would say just a big problem for all WASM stuff right now is the kind of time to interactivity is a, tends to be a little slower than JavaScript, just because um, WASM binary sizes are big and it's very hard to. Um, to bundle split. So you, you don't get that same, like a JavaScript, you know, something in a framework like solid or Svelte that might load like 10 kilobytes of JavaScript in order to make your page interactive. Well, Leptos is going to be like 10 kilobytes of JavaScript plus, you know, whatever, a hundred kilobytes of, of web assembly once it's all gzipped and stuff. So it's just like that, that, that interactive time, which is part of the e-commerce thing, right? If you're doing like eBay, or if you're doing something where milliseconds are literally dollars in terms of load time, uh, there's no WebAssembly technology that's that's really good for you right now. Yeah. Hold on one second. I'm just going to... Too much arguments going on. Too much arguments in, in the, the darn YouTube chat. I swear they're crazy. Uh, so, oh, geez. Uh, all right. I really do appreciate that. Uh, I One, I do have... One more question. I think that's, by the way, I think that's really good to know kind of where your weaknesses are. Uh, mm -hmm. Just because it is, you know, it is it is a hard sell to have that much WASM come down. Now, whether or not it's good, you know, long term, there's also caching, blah, blah, blah. You can make a lot of arguments, but, you know, none of that really fixes first load. And, you know, that's still important to a lot of people. That's still very, very important to a lot of people. Uh, mm -hmm. One more question. I, I'm just curious, in your head, you have these server functions. I've never actually even played with it. How, uh, how do they work? What's, what, do you, what do you do there? What's going on underneath the hood? So when I go and play yeah. with them, I want to know. Because obviously there yeah. must be a route that it somehow generates. Some router yeah. has to pick that up. There's, you know, obviously there must be the components server functions route that actually just then has a mapping that knows how to get there, right? Yeah, so yeah. what's the... What's the deal? It's, it's it's awesome. I actually really, really like them. It's one of my favorite features. And it's something where I actually think, um, again, it's inspired by SolidJS. I like our version better because it gets around some of like the, the pitfalls almost. Um, but basically, we have a server proc macro, right? And you can use it if I declare like function, my server function, and I put that server macro annotating it. Um, what that does is it takes the body of the function 
and it has like a certain return type, right? So it returns like a result of whatever type you want and then server function error. Um, but it takes the body of the function and it rewrites the function so that on the server, your function just runs. And on the client, um, it defines a route on the server. And when you call the function on the client, it um, sends a request to the server with the arguments, runs it on the server, and then sends back the data. So basically, what you can do is like in a single file, you can um, have you know, your component that's defining the user interface for um, adding a post to your blog in the database. And then in that file, you define, here's a server function that's like add post. Um, and when you click the button and it calls that server function on the client, it's actually sending a request to the server. Um, and then the next level is the way that it does that. Um, it actually uses um, like URL form, you know, a form URL encoding rather than sending like a JSON or something for the arguments. But what that means is that you can actually build a form out of it so that say I have arguments like title and content, which are both strings to my server function, then I can have a form and I can put an input name equals title, the text area name equals content, and I can actually put the, the action of that form is the server function URL, and when I submit the form, it makes a post request to the server function and does it. Um, and then we do like you know some progressive enhancement if you have the WASM enabled, but what that does is it actually means that you can create a form that can function correctly before the JavaScript and WebAssembly have loaded. And it just acts like a traditional like multi-page app form that you're posting something. And then if the WASM has loaded, it will do it client side and it gives you like optimistic UI and stuff. Um, so it's just like a really nice graceful degradation thing because of that WASM load time and stuff. Um, but basically, yeah, so the idea with server functions is that you can just like co-locate stuff. So you can write rather than the kind of old school model, right? Which would be like, I have three things, which are I have a server with some business logic. I have a client with the UI. And then in the middle, I have this third thing that is a contract that's like a REST API that the middle this way. guy hits and that calls this guy. Yeah, um, basically you just cut out the middleman, um, which is again, like it's the sort of thing that if you're working on a huge project with big teams, you probably do want more explicit contracts and APIs. Yeah. But if you are just building an application yourself, or if you have teams where people are working on stuff that's really independent, um, like it's kind of good to be able to write that logic yourself, right? Uh, someone just actually brought up a really great question, which this I have hit this, and I'm not sure what the state of modern web is versus previous, which is, isn't there a limit uh, to the URL length? And how big are these form encodings? I, you know, you could technically write a lot, but I mean, last time I, I haven't looked into this in 10 years and there was a bug on Xbox and being able to sign in, I think this is the bug with Netflix like eight years ago, where the length of the URL got too long and would explodiate yeah. through some Microsoft server. And so I, I thought it was 2000. And so, I mean, yeah. that does leave a lot of room for, a, I mean, there's a lot of form you can send in, yeah, yeah. in 2000. Uh, yeah, 2, so, characters. There, so two things. One, there's a distinction, right, between... Um, okay, so I just want to say, because HTML is the greatest programming language of all time, I'm just going to throw that out there, there's a distinction between a form method equals get and method equals post, right? And a get form is kind of like a navigation where you are adding things to the query string, uh, and it's putting it in the URL. In, this is in the body, okay. A post form is in the body. So this is using post, and it's putting it in the body. So it's the same as any other HTML form you could do. I'm sure there's still a limit. Um, I myself have run into the URL length issue because I was doing something, um, putting everything in the URL, which I love because you can copy and paste and share a URL and reproduce the state. I had this huge like JSON object that I had serialized <laughs> and put in the URL oh, no. and it got to be too long. So people were, were, were sharing stuff with this huge num amount of configuration stuffed in there. Um, and I actually, I ended up using a, like a JSON compression thing to get it to like a base 64 string. You didn't deco it? It's great. It's a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. Don't get yourself in that situation. This is the sort of thing that happens with like feature creep when you're doing freelance work and you're a one person team. And initially they say, <laughs> you know, we don't need like a, yeah. yeah, we don't need a server side, right? We don't want a database. Like we don't need this stuff because we don't want to pay you for it and we don't want to pay to maintain it. 
Um, so like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. We'll just do, and this is like a, a mobile app that had a web app too, right? And it's whatever. Um, it's all client side stuff. Um, but then they're like, hey, yeah, we really want to be able to like, you create this document and then you share it with somebody. And I'm like, okay, well, we can do that if we just, instead of using a database to save it, we just encode everything in the URL. And then suddenly, yeah, you hit, you know, mobile Safari has a different URL length limit or whatever, and you can't reproduce the bug because it's just mobile Safari or whatever it is, you know? So yeah, don't, don't, don't do stupid things like that. <laughs> I'm on your team. Don't do stupid things. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> what can you do? If you can't use a database, there's only one other storage that's available that can be shared or repointed to, which is the URL. Exactly. By the way, why didn't you go with Deku encoding? Come on. Um, encode that with sweet binary and then just put that in the URL. Didn't know Deku existed at the time. That's probably why. <laughs> we do have, I'll say with the server functions too, we do have, um, you can use Cbor encoding. So it doesn't work with the forms then because like a form doesn't know about that. But if you are just doing it with the, you know, with like Leptos, with Wasm, you can actually use a binary encoding to send stuff to server functions. Um, so it doesn't have to be like serializable to, to text or something. And it can be a pretty big object. Okay. Yeah. Because I was using, uh, so when I'm playing around kind of like with Vim Royale, right. It's like, you know, yeah, yeah, a yeah. fun project I'm doing every mm -hmm. now and then. And that one I was able to, I can currently hot swap out JSON or Deku and the program's none the wiser, right? Because it all just uses proc macros and serialization. So, you know, it has no idea really what's going on. There's an if statement somewhere that's like, use this one or use that one, but that's about it. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, then the thing, the thing that I love about that, right, is um, it's like very rusty way. I remember people, I was watching the stream a little while ago and people were asking about like, oh, but like, why are you saying Rust can do this without super JSON and um, whatchamacallit, Zod or whatever? And I was like, yeah, this is just like Sirity. This is just how it works, right? If, it, yeah. if it's deserializing something that's not valid, it just gives you an error. You know, it's like not a big deal um, that it's this, and it can serialize stuff. It doesn't matter the type of it, as long as it, it's like, if it derives the trait, like it's just, it's just what we do, right? I know um, it's so hard to, yeah, to like describe out. that. It's hard to describe that because if you yeah. don't have, the problem is, is if your fundamental notion is that what you decode eventually becomes a, like, like a map, then you don't have this idea that no, the schema really is the thing you say it's going to be. So why have a schema plus the thing you, say it's going to then you have to like do this like double running of everything you have to like decode it plus make it decode again but in a sec it's just it just seems crazy talk to me but there's no equivalent in in, in json and like we love smart typescript engineers right smart typescript engineers will do give you a thing that does like a runtime yeah, validation odd. but that also comes out with the right types and like these people are doing type stuff that's way beyond me and it's awesome and i'm just like hey or Pound hashtag drive bracket. serialize deserialize right <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like i don't know man it's i don't know i i kudos to you for doing that but an alternative is using a real program language and that's what like when people like like me and i think like you who'd like rust um joke about javascript it's not like it's not about people using javascript right it's just like as as a language once you use other languages it just is so limited in what you can actually do with yeah. your stuff and it's it's so limiting to you right like so how mm. i try to relate it is that if you're old enough you have done javascript you started off in a javascript world and maybe you came from java right maybe you came from c plus plus and you started doing javascript and you're like wow, this is so much better. Uh, I really, really like this. Yeah, there's some things I don't like about it, but man, this is better. Uh, I don't really need types. Uh, types are silly. I don't really need them, right? You kind of develop this mentality. You start doing it. And then after a while, you try TypeScript. And there's this weird thing that happens. You realize, wait a second, I do like types. Like, I did really like this experience. And you realize how bad it was being in JavaScript. But then you just stop there. And you're just like, oh, it can't get any better. And you're like, no, well, the problem is, is things can get better or there's trade-offs. Like you should just keep on trying new things because you'll realize like, wow, that's like, you can't tell somebody why enums are so great in Rust if all they know are TypeScript enums. Like TypeScript enums are the devil and Rust enums are, you can have what makes Go so painful in types just right there. You don't have to have interfaces anymore. You can just have proper types everywhere you need them. And so it's like, it's so hard to describe those problems because you can only get there by doing it once i feel like i can't you know no one could tell me that right if they told me i'd go i don't get it like yeah. i mean i get what you're yeah. saying but i don't get it yeah 
I just want to just reading chat too. I want to give a shout out to the person who said, yes, my, my position is indeed that Rust and HTML are the only real programming <laughs> languages. That's um, <laughs> so amazing. I, you know, you, you all know that I'm trolling you, but it's also true, right? Like people don't appreciate, I think there's been a renaissance in people kind of rediscovering HTML, right? And like HTML now versus HTML 15 yeah. years ago, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do. Um, and even things like, like they, the thing that frustrates me is they continue doing really dumb stuff, like the new dialogue element which is amazing right you can use it to create modals only like it doesn't respond to the open attribute or something like there's there's always dumb stuff like you always have to call some method they're always like you know what you know what was amazing yeah. like 90s style imperative object oriented programming let's do that um but you know so like fair enough like but i i just i think people like the more you learn about stuff like how to really use forms even stupid stuff like the details element that i feel like is really underused like partly because you can't style it a lot but, you know, and I think partly this is also coming from me, right? Trying to ship as little WebAssembly as possible to make the page load as fast as possible. But the same applies to trying to ship as little JavaScript as possible. Like the more you can use stuff that's already built into the browser in HTML, mm -hmm. the less code you're writing, which means the fewer bugs you're writing, which means the less code you're shipping, which means the faster your page is loading. Like it's it's really win-win the more you learn about HTML, which is the world's, I will admit it, the world's second greatest programming language after after Rust. Yeah, you know, uh, HTML is definitely tragic in some of their, their consistency and integration with JavaScript, like such as like on change on a select doesn't work. Like that just, that, that just emotionally damages me. Like you should have just made on change work. Like you, I understand that on select is technically more correct or on selected, but it changed. Let's not, let's not beat around the bush here. Let's just I, like, let's just be real. <laughs> I got to tell you something that literally, literally physically hurt me when I saw it. Um, so somebody was asking me about something with one of the canvas APIs. Can you, can you pull up docs.rs and go to the web sys docs? Okay. Let's see. Uh, docs, uh, docs RS, uh, it's web dash sys, right? Uh, it should be underscore. Oh. Uh, there we go. I can't. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So if you go to HTML canvas element, uh, let's see if I can just find an HTML canvas element. There we go. And go to the just the first function get context. Let's see. Uh, get context. There we go. Okay. So m either move me or scroll so that people can see the whole function signature there. All right. Let me just. I'll put you up so you can see it at yeah, the yeah. same time. It's nice. This and is the this is the most cursed function I've ever seen. Look at that. PubFun get context takes self, great, takes context ID and string, and it returns result, option, object, jazz value, which means this function, when you call it, could be an error. Could be an error, right? Because literally anything can throw anywhere, fine. Or it could be nothing, <laughs> or it could be some object, but we cannot make any other claims about what that object is other than it's a JavaScript object. Because the way they designed this API was you pass one of like four strings and each of those strings corresponds to a different JavaScript class hmm. for one of these four different like canvas oh, contexts. Oh, that's right. Because there's like canvas object context 2D. There's, there's all those other ones. Oh, I like the fact that you also can get a JS value. Like, you, I mean... The reality is JavaScript can just like, oh, it's an error, but it's a string. And you're just like, yes. what the, why would you yes, make it a string? Yes, because the error type can be anything. So There's somebody asked me this question, like, how do I get the context? And I was like, drill a hole in my head <laughs> before. <laughs> it's like, that is so bad. And, I, and so like that, right? And mm. you know, the thing that kills me, right, is like, it's written in C++. Right? There's the defined types. not written in JavaScript. Yeah, there's so defined types. Is, so yeah, so somebody's taking a static, like a, a type, <laughs> like casting it into just like a generic JavaScript object and then returning it to you. And it just kills me. It's so brutal. So that's what, like when I, when I tease JavaScript, it's, it's stuff like this that like, well, yeah, but like, Greg, you say, if I just write my code right, <laughs> I know what string I'm passing in and therefore I know what class I'm getting out. So who cares? And it's like, well, yeah, if you just write all your code right, everything's fine. <laughs> That's not how anyone's life has ever gone, though. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, who's constantly breaking stuff in production because I swore that function would never return undefined, and it did, and then I tried to access a field on undefined. That's actually pretty funny. You know, that is, a, that is a pretty curse. <laughs> Anytime the, you do the result option, I, I just feel like there's something has gone a little bit goofy there. It's like not only can it be an error, but it can also just not be there. It's just like, 
why do you why would you want to handle this many separate cases? Like it just feels so it just it's hard for me. But I mean I get it. I get that, but for HTML that probably shouldn't happen. Either the thing's there or it's not there. It's not I I just don't understand why not there is not an error. Sorry, you asked for something that doesn't exist. This canvas can't exist. Here you go. <laughs> right. Also right. stack trace. Mm. <laughs> the stack so trace. Anyway, that got a little far afield, but I just thought you would appreciate that one as far as JavaScript as a language and its type system. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's very impressive because I think for the most part, if I'm not mistaken, TypeScript, because it's its ability to be like a programmatic type system, it can kind of define itself around these things. I think it actually does return the correct type given the string, blah, 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 because you can overload yeah. things for specific types. And that's just the power of having a crazy type system. Yeah, TypeScript can do cool stuff with strings and template strings and things. Um, and I don't know how exactly it works, but like, that's true. Like in Rust, a string is a string is a string. So, you know, that that is like a, a trade off, I guess. Mm -hmm. I found I, I'll have to re come back up with the uh, example, but I found a hole in the TypeScript current system. I don't know if it's still a problem in 5.0, but if you use the method and you pass in a string, it will tell you what your arguments should be. But inside the method, if you say, here's my string, it'll say, I still don't know what your arguments are. You have to like right. cast them to figure it out. So it can figure it out on the outside, just not on the inside what right. uh what the types should be so it's like this string matches to this type based in a map and you do a generic with a key of type of and it just like explodiates and i think the thing that people don't Extends. get about the differences between typescript and something like rust is that the reason rust is so strict about types and stuff is because it literally needs to know how to lay things out in memory mm -hmm. whereas typescript is always going to fall back to javascript's dynamic type system so even if you think something is this really strict or static or whatever type I, I don't know any of the technical type terms right but even if you have everything fully type scripted out um at runtime javascript doesn't know about any of that stuff so you don't get any of the like performance benefits of having all the types there but you you do get some so like rust wouldn't ha ever have a situation where it had that inference wrong because it would be like how do i f where do i put this thing in memory like how do i fit it into the computer like it just needs to know stuff which is part of why it's less flexible but also part of why it um you know the inference and everything is so perfect yeah yeah that's one thing that is really hard to describe to people is that typescript fundamentally works in such a way that no matter what you create instantaneously goes to the heap in some way or the other it's a boxed value that mm -hmm. isn't ref counted it's not you know it's it's not cleaned up when it goes out of scope it's held on to until its garbage collection ring has been called to be collected. And so if you last longer than, I don't know, 500 milliseconds, how fast are you garbage collecting? How long does it stay in the nursery? You can't even like define its performance characteristics. I actually wanted to, I, this is like a rant I've been, I feel very ranty about, which is you'll see these things where people like compete uh, JavaScript against C++. I just saw one recently where they're just like, see JavaScript's about half the speed of C++, but they're all like a bunch of calculation functions in which you're totally missing the fact that JavaScript has an entire other side of it, which is garbage collection and that whole side, which you can't measure in a tight loop doing calculations. That doesn't exist. You're just, you're only testing JIT versus compiled and optimized. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. monomorphic and it, JIT, like you're giving it the best possible case JIT. That's not yeah. usually your average. Yeah, and it's the reason you see even in, so I want to say on um, Dread Pirate Roberts, right? I, I want to get to that question about full WASM support in the DOM, but the reason you see some, some of the performance differences in like something like JS Framework Benchmark, right? That's really artificial and just rendering speed, whatever. All of the WASM frameworks are already faster than any of the JavaScript ones in things like swapping two rows. So render a thousand rows and then swap row two and row 998 or whatever, starting at zero, and you swap them. And it's because the WASM, the list diffing is so much faster because in JavaScript, it can, you know, JIT optimize something, but it also always has to be ready to de-optimize and like bail out yes. at any given, any given iteration. Um, so WASM is already faster at certain kinds of, you know, operations it's just the stuff that's writing across to the DOM. So people are constantly asking about, um, you know, when does WASM get direct DOM access? Because then, um, in terms of performance, if if WASM can interact directly with the DOM, um, it should be much faster than JavaScript for all those operations too. Um, assuming that they let you do things like use UTF-8 strings, 
which is one of the big big issues right now is because JavaScript is UTF-16. Correct. So passing things from WASM into JavaScript into the DOM, actually you have to re-encode every string. Um, but I mean, th I think that the answer is at least three or four years ago, they were starting to work on interface types stuff, um, which would be like allow you to do that. And over time, it looks like they've gotten more and more general with those proposals. So now there's like this component model proposal, and it's because people are trying to use WASM in more and more environments, like using it um, for WASM time, like for serverless, for yep. um, plugin systems, and they want to make a more generic model. So it's not just how does WASM access the DOM, it's how does WASM interact with its host environment. Um, and I think the result of that has been just taking time to develop that stuff. And then the thing with browser development is like, you know, WASM time already implements the component model, right? But it's not like Chrome implements the component model, Firefox implements the component model, Safari implements it, iOS Safari implements it, iOS Safari on your grandma's iPad that she can't update anymore implements it. I still and have that's an iPad really one. The, the problem. I still have an yeah, iPad man. one. And, and it works, but there are probably sites that it breaks. You see this with people shipping JavaScript with um, question mark dot, the um, what do you call that? Interrobang. Optional chaining, optional oh. chaining, right? Um, where people, people ship. They say, ah, oh, man, we, we don't need to, um, you know, transpile to ES5 or whatever anymore. Yeah. We can do more modern versions. Everybody has more modern. If, you ha if you're on an iPad that's old that you can't update, then you can't update Safari, and it just breaks on your – I mean, it just, it just is not valid JavaScript syntax, right? So it's, it's problems like that. I would say – I said to somebody earlier today, like, I think probably within the next two or three years we might have direct DOM access. Um, the reality is if you look at these benchmarks and stuff – it's not actually a performance issue for us anymore. It would be awesome to have, um, but like you can write a Leptos app that's faster than any JavaScript framework except solid. So at that point, like the direct DOM access doesn't matter that much. Yeah, if, if, if React can exist, then that whole entire argument about performance is not a real argument. Now the, the, the... Yeah. so do you think there, what causes such big, um... Uh, wasm sized bundles like what is the, why are they 250k why are they these sizes yeah 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 well i mean if you think about it um i think there are a couple reasons one is that like a binary executable is always going to be larger than an interpreted text file um just across the board right so like a python file versus a c plus plus application that do the same thing right it's so it's not like rust specific or wasm specific um but I think one of the big things people don't think about too is like JavaScript gets to ship its entire standard library in your browser, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty huge. And like, uh, you know, Rust, that say it's, um, say a basic, we'll say Sycamore instead of Leptos. Sycamore gets a little smaller bundle size, right? Sycamore can, can give you a basic component that's like 40 kilobytes of WASM ungzipped. In that 40 kilobytes, you have. It's amazing. It's great. Yeah, Leptos is maybe 60 right now. Um, and that's un-gzipped. Gzip, that's like 15. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't consider um, Gzip wire size. That's yeah, that's always yeah, dramatically yeah. smaller. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but if you think about what that bundle includes, that includes a memory allocator. That includes, if you use a VEC, that includes the implementation of VEC for every type that, every T VEC. that there's yeah. a VEC T, right? Because Rust monomorphizes stuff. Um, you know, like, it has to ship everything you need to run that application. It doesn't just have a, a JavaScript array that your browser has the implementation of. So it's kind of like there's a little bit of um, apples to oranges where a bunch of the binary size of a bunch of the bundle size of JavaScript is actually living in your browser already installed on your computer. If they had to ship everything that they need to implement it, it would be very different. But so I think that's one of the big differences. Yeah, the whole V8 thing really gives JavaScript a leg up. The, you know, mm -hmm. they have that whole, like, list concept where you can put anything inside of a list. And, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, no one had to make a code for that. Uh, Lithium did have a really good question. I do want to hear this one as well, which was uh, state management. What, what do you currently use for state management? Because when we talked, I just used, you know, uh, there's a global context. There's a use context in which you can pass in a type, which is super cool that you can use generics, pass in a type, and out comes the actual thing that you put in there, which is super convenient. Uh, and then I just take that and I box leak it. For those that don't do Rust, that effectively means you tell the compiler that this thing will never die, so therefore keep it around forever. So you get this reference to it, which will live for the entirety of the program. It also makes it super easy. I believe it implements clone off the rip, so you can just like 
pass it around to wherever and it's just a super simple and so that's been my current state management solution which is just one global context object though i'm sure there's better well, what is your current take on this yeah yeah so on on um state management um and just one i guess one last point thread, thread pirate roberts you're asking about binary size dynamic dispatch yes gets smaller binary sizes and there are other tricks that you can do like um that i can do really that like using a um if you have a generic function but you can implement like a concrete function internally so it doesn't need to monomorphize all of that stuff that's another trick and i, I just got like a three to five percent wasm binary shrinkage across the framework by doing some of that stuff just a hour or two of work um i've never heard a man so impressed by shrinkage as you yeah, man, uh, three to five percent shrinkage is big when you're when you're <laughs> uh, killing me. Um, but so the so state management, right? I, I think I have like two or three different answers. Um, answer number one is if you're writing any meaningful application with like multiple routes, your primary state management solution should be the URL. So like the primary thing that de determines the state of your application, in my opinion, should be the URL. Um, you can have local state within pages, within components. Um, like, am I, what do I have entered in this form? Um, but basically, any change possible should be reflected in the router so that if somebody reloads the page or if somebody, um, I mean, it's a universal resource locator, right? Like, if you're doing big state changes that aren't reflected in the URL, probably not a great idea. People will be frustrated when they copy and paste a URL and it doesn't work. Um, so that's like answer number one, which is like, making the remix guys happy, right? That's like Ryan Florence is out there pushing this every day, URLs as state management. Answer number two, like in a practical sense, um, I think what you saw with, um, with Vim Royale, right, is when you're like writing leptose code, you're actually not writing very much leptose code. Yeah. You're writing your code, and then when you need to update something reactively, you're like writing to a signal that you've stored somewhere. And that's yes. a really, really good way of doing it, I think. Um, and because the signals are not, like coupled to components really, unlike a set state or something, um, you can you can do that. You can store them all somewhere and then just update them. And that's a really smart thing to do. I think using context is the answer, right? Um, because if you create some signals up here and then you pass them down with provide context, when you consume them down here, it doesn't cause like everything in the tree underneath it to re-render like it would with a really naive use of React context. Um, because you're getting a signal and you're pulling it out right here. So if I set it over here and I use it down here, when I set it here, it just updates this thing down here. Like it doesn't cause any other effect in the tree. So passing signals with context is really effective. I mean, we've had um, somebody created this create slice API, which basically created like a, if you had a big state object, like a state machine that was going to drive your whole application, you could create a slice of it, which would give you a signal for just one of the fields. Um, and that would only update when that field changed. So you could do almost like an Elm style or like a U classic component where you just have a data struct and you put a signal around that. And then you create a lot of little slices of it that update in a fine grained way. Um, so there are a couple of different solutions, but honestly, just taking a signal and passing it through context is, is really simple. Um, for anything like theming or whatever that you need to do that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because when I was doing uh, the, the Vim Royale stuff, because it's a much different use case, right? This is not, yeah. it is a single page app in, I guess, if you will, the most in intentional term of that, which is you play an actual game. Single page. Yeah, you, you play a literal game in the browser. Therefore, yeah. having a bunch of, you know, effectively signals for me to manipulate your movement and all that made it exceptionally simple. Whereas I don't think trying to render that top down or even at specific locations within the whole set would make it very hard and also make it probably slow enough to be a little ouchy. But this, yeah, uh, exactly. this felt really good, very fast. I really liked it. Yeah, um, yeah. People are saying with create slice, it sounds like redux slices. Yes, exactly. Same exact concept. Okay. Okay. So, all right. I, I, I do like, I do like the idea of URL. So that's something. So in about 2015, when we were creating Falcor, uh, the ultimate data fetcher, pre-TRPC -TRPC, TRPC thing, right? Uh, that also involved caching. By the way, caching, exceptionally hard. I don't know if you've ever written a caching item. It's extremely hard. I did it for over a year. I never, it never was quite right. Caching is really hard. Um, 
during that time, our big thing was URLs should be the main decider of what happens on the page, right? Like that was the thing. That was the state management. And, you know, React Router definitely does happen and things happen and mm -hmm. it's never quite as good. But I really did like the idea that URL is the driving uh, the driving force. Not pre-TCP, TRCP. Wait, TRPCRP. Yeah, dang it. What is it? PCP. <laughs> PCP. <laughs> Kids, PCP, a gallon of it. Um, GPC. <laughs> GRPC, right? GCP, that's a different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But GRPC. yeah. So yeah, it was like, I really liked that notion. Um, I'm curious how well that works in larger and larger and larger environments because, you know, we did try some of it. It, it always looks amazing in any toy app you build. Yeah. Oh, dude. Okay, don't lie to me. Okay, first off, LG... Okay, I, I can never get that right. Looks good to me. I always spell like this. Looks that. That one. That one right there. I can looks, never... Yeah, I always go... LG, looks too goomy. Yeah, I always say that. I'm like, I didn't get it right, but I think they got the idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely with the URL driving state thing, right? You get these things like, okay, so then if I have a modal that comes up on the page, does that mean I'm supposed to have like slash modal in the URL? And someone's like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, okay, well, what if that's not the final route what if it's like slash users slash id slash account but i want to put a modal down here on slash users and it's like sl as a, uh, uh. Yeah, yeah i, I can understand how it doesn't actually scale that well to more complicated things there just comes a point where you accidentally i mean um, the problem with a modal is it, it really is two routes in one you're yep. creating two a two uis you have two layers and once you do that you f your whole thing up and everybody's sad about it Sorry, these are like me, like back when I used to try to do the uh, UI architect stuff, and this was just like the emotional turmoil of trying to make these like hard and fast rules, like URL for everybody, and then you come across them like this, and you're like, I hate my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well that's great. Hey Greg, I appreciate you coming on. This was great. I need to go invest. Awesome. I'm gonna go play around with uh, the your server functions and uh, Cloudflare. See, try to make those things work out because. That's like a big starting of it all, right? Awesome. Yep. And check out, I, I, I sent you in chat just the branch that I was working on some of this Cloudflare stuff. It's not going to compile because there's some weird type, but uh, delete the thing that doesn't compile and do deal with the rest of it. Yep. Um, but hopefully you can see a little bit of what I was talking about with that like leftos routes thing and all that. Um, okay. But yeah, this is fun. Yeah, this was great. I appreciate having you on. It was great to know you. Hey, let's get your uh, let's let's get your little Twitter in here, huh? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, we and gotta thanks, get some Twitter. Thanks, chat. You guys have been very uh, very great. I hope I ticked you all off by talking about HTML. Um, the second greatest programming language ever. <laughs> <laughs> You're really emotionally hurting people with that one. All right, go give Greg a follow. Good guy. Obviously, crushing it out on on some sweet. Uh, Whatever you call this stuff. There you go. My hand's on the wrong side. Crushing it out with all the Wasm, Leptos, Rust stuff. You probably are much better at Rust than I am. You know, I find that until you write a library, Rust is actually pretty easy. Mm. The moment you mm -hmm. go library, all of a sudden Rust gets way harder. Yeah, yeah, it definitely, definitely is like there is a level of... But it's also cool, right? Because there, there are certain kinds of errors that it's like somebody will come to me with an error and it's like, what is this weird message? And I'm like, oh yeah, you just need to X. Cause I've done it a hundred times myself, right? It's like, you see the same error messages yeah. over and over with all the generics and la 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 la. Um, and I'll say, honestly, like doing stuff with the browser world is even different because I get to not deal with a lot of things like lifetimes or whatever, cause the browser wants everything to be static lifetimes anyway. So you're just like doing RCs and, and it's all single threaded. Right? So there are whole areas that like, I rely on other people a lot for, um, and we have a great community of people contributing who know a lot more than I do about certain things. So, um, yeah, I would say I would say follow me. Um, I somebody's asking. I do have Mastodon. I don't really use it. Um, <laughs> and jump into our our Discord. The Discord is in the Leptos repository. Uh, Read me. We have a great community of people there. So um, let's get yeah, your Discord up all. here. Hold on. Let's get your dis. Let's yeah, yeah. Get, So it's GitHub.com/slash Lepto. Oh, I know. It's it's Greg. It's no. It's Leptos RS slash Leptos oh, now. Oh, getting fancy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's real. Now you're. And I like your logo. It looks really We've nice. We've got a logo I underscore know. funk. All right. So let's see. Is it under the, the primary it's one? It's that Leptos? one, yep. yep okay. Yep. Okay, most excellent. And then let's go Discord. Oh, Discord doesn't even appear Did on the main go page. Go down. go down. Scroll down. It's the button up under the logo. Okay, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Discord. Oh, my goodness. Why didn't that find it? 
Discord. I don't know. It it's doesn't... probably like an SG, SVG or something. It's... Oh yeah, it does not find it. You you Bad may not be able to see that little red little red thing. All right, so yeah. I can go right here, follow that, copy that invite. Oh look at that, I'm accepting it. Look at that. Yep, beautiful. Is this turning into an ad? At what point does this become an ad? I think I have to pay you. I wish I had. <laughs> did you ever watch Sushi Dragon? No. Oh my goodness, he does this did thing I? where he uh he presses a button. And yeah. oh, he, if you've never seen a stream, it's a wild trip. But he presses yeah. a button and it goes booze, you know, like turn the background all white and it'll play like a really, like just the perfect piano song. And it'll say like actual customer underneath. And you'll be like, well, thank you for letting me do, you know, and he'll go into a customer pitch right yeah, in the yeah. middle of it. It's beautiful. Docs you incoming. <laughs> have you seen um, uh, Ken, Ken Wheeler's tweet about solid JS? No. You want to see a, a user testimonial? Oh, man. I, that's, a, that's a testimonial for you. Well, I like anything that Ken Wheeler says because, you know, 80% of the time it's 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 fair on the spice scale. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're going to want to search for like, I think it was like 900 lines or something. Okay, hold on. We'll, we'll go like this. Ken, 900 lines. Lions, like the cat. Okay. Lions. All right, here we go. You can see the beat. Let's see the beast in action here. Fury of Wait, Dynamics. this is actually apparently he's used this several times. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Ken. Okay, well. Or, or search for him in like Solid JS or something. All right, Ken, Solid JS. <sighs> Ken. Wait, isn't there like a from command from uh, Ken Wheeler? Really? Wheeler, can I just search up? Oh my, dude, I effing, I hate, I hate. What? How come they don't show me a single person I follow? Now, <laughs> like, wasn't at there least... some fella? Wasn't there like a 10x programmer who was gonna fix this in three days? Where how was the not fixing? Fixed? Oh my goodness, thank you. Oh Theo. yeah, yeah. Some, some Theo put it there. Yeah, thank yeah, you, yeah. Theo. Thank you, Theo. Holy cow! So, oh my goodness, Twitter search. User is... testimonial. First time in a while, I woke up and coded for fun, and Solid JS feels like a lot like where I wish React. Yeah. I agree. Every third time I tweet, use third tweet, third tweet, third tweet down. down. Oh, it's nine thousand lions that oh. were fed nothing but Monster Zero Ultra. <laughs> Imagine somebody tweeting that about your library. Jeez. That I mean, look at that. He ratioed himself. So I mean, it's obviously a good tweet. When you ratio yourself, you've done something right here. Oh, amazing. I do. I do like it. I feel like I always struggled a little bit with uh with with the hook system. I feel mm -hmm. like it's not quite there. I feel like I'm always uh, effectively, I, I, I said this to Theo, I don't know how much Theo agreed with it, but I always said it felt like I was doing uh, object-oriented programming. Like I have these properties, but these properties can be attached anywhere. And so it's like I'm creating these quasi-classes and it always felt like I'm, I never quite really got a good grip on it where I didn't feel like that was solid. I felt like I got it right away. So maybe it's unfair. I've never been like a. I've, I've written a couple of React apps. I'm not. I'm not a React programmer by any means. But it is. It's telling to me that like a big part of the like tech Twitter conversation is people posting a screenshot of their own React code that's like a ten line component and being like, "You will never believe when this console log logs." <laughs> And it's like, yeah. I'm sorry, you, you don't know when your code runs? Like, what? Like, is, is, is this library that hard that you, you have genuine problems? Like, my experience of React is people being like, I don't know when this effect runs. And then React 18 comes out, they're like in strict mode, and they're like, now, nah, wait, now it runs twice. And like, maybe this is not fair, but I feel like that, that, that's been like the React narrative and why a lot of people are looking at the fine grain stuff. Because it's like, I finally understand when my code runs. And anyone out there who's a React person can be like, Greg, you're an idiot. You just don't know how to use React. That's true. That's yeah, very true. That's fair, However, perfect. my point is that all these React influencers seem not to know how to use React either. And that's like I still don't think React hooks part. have a solid... I mean, I know Theo loves them, but I don't think the story makes as much sense as a reactive signal. A reactive signal is a one-to-one -one with some sort of render. And for me, that is like a... It's a very simple way to look at the world, which is this point changes when this happens and just this point now it may produce new html it may produce new signals it may produce a bunch of new stuff but nonetheless like this point is tied with this point and for me that's a very simple idea for my yeah. i have small monkey brain small mon and small it's monkeys every, well every framework right is based on functions rerunning themselves which is why we have all these like closures in in leptos or in solid like everything is a function that reruns itself because how else can it update something 
And the problem is that in React, the function that reruns itself is your whole component, but there's always a bunch of stuff inside the component you don't want to rerun when it updates. Mm -hmm. So in solid or leptose, you're just like, no, just make those functions that rerun smaller, make it yes. like the value of this text node, and then that's all that reruns. So you don't have to worry about like, like how do I do a set timeout, right? Like it's just, you do it. It's I, a setup function, you know, it's that kind of thing. I do, I do like the idea that of constructor functions versus render functions. I feel like that's, it was harder the first time I used it to build something because I was just like, okay, gosh, how do I set this up? This is really hard, right? The first time I did it, it was hard. Yeah. But yeah. then oh, yeah. after, you know, like that initial hump was harder. But then afterwards, for me, the idea of a, of a, uh, what's it called? A construct function makes way more sense because it's like this, you put in where it changes and there's only one chance. There's no like re going back over state and re having a different outcome when this thing, you know, happens. It's like, this is the place where it happened. For me, it just, it, it dramatically simplified how I think about things in my brain. No, no. Personal yeah. experience. <laughs> Theo, I think you asked about VS Code. I, I did. I, I used to use VS Code. I've switched to using Vim more because honestly, VS Code, um, like I, Leptos is a pretty big, like project that I, I work in with all the different packages and stuff, and it literally now lags on keystrokes. So I actually had to switch to an editor that was not so damn slow. And this is on an M1, you know, MacBook, right? And it like it literally lags on keystrokes or on saving files and stuff. So I, I have actually mixed it up for smaller projects. I think I think VS Code is okay for for Rust and for some stuff. But um, yeah, it's, I've, I've, I've switched away from it. Yeah, have you have you played around with any of the, like, the predefined NeoVim distributions just to take all that stuff out? Like, just give me AstroVim. Yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't done any of, the, any, of the, any of the distributions. I actually used one of your videos and got set up with, with a pretty good setup with, um, I'm pretty happy with things. I need to learn a little bit more still. The one thing I really miss is um, being able to see um, errors in other files, like my diagnostics only go within the same file. And I like that little VS code sidebar. It's like red, bad, yeah, yellow. Yeah, so there is morning. a way around that. There is a way around yeah, that. Yeah. There's this idea of make project and you can literally just like make project. And do you know what a quick fix list is yet? If you don't, that's okay. Maybe. All right, so. No, code actions, I mean. No, 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 quick fix list. No. Okay, so okay. here we go. So I'm gonna go in here. Oh, dang, I only have one file. Let's, uh, here, let's. Let's go to Vim Royale. Let's go somewhere else. All right, so if I go into the view, right, uh, just pick a view, go in here, and I'll go into, where is it? Is there a terminal? If I'm not mistaken, I have a few references. Okay, so I have this thing. I can use my LSP to generate a list of references to this thing. Now, what mm -hmm. this, these two references are is what is referred to as a quick fix list. So right now, I can go up and I can select each one. But the thing yep. is, is a quick fix list lasts forever. So I can close this. And now I can navigate back and forth between my quick fix list. And Ooh. so I can do a search via telescope right there, right? Mm -hmm. Grep. And I can go like this terminal. And it has all these references to all the different stuff. So let's 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 reduce it down to everything that has the word view in it. Right? There we go. Nice. So now I'm gonna press control Q. I sent that over to my quick fix list. I close it off, and now I can scroll through one at a time all my quick fix lists. And you can see it right there, or right here. It says five, four, three, two, one up to seven and you can just walk through it and so quick fix lists are super useful so what you can do is you can actually take tsc or rust cargo blah 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 pipe the build through make project into a quick fix list and you'll get your entire projects errors nice. that you can walk through one at a time and by the way how i'm walking is i just have a remap for c next and c pre nice yeah yeah that's oh, awesome. Yeah, those keys <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I mean, that's that's the great that's the great thing. But you know, I mean, I think it's I think it's nice. I like the 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 Rust analyzer support is is really good. So yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, it's it's real nice. Yeah. So you can do those kind of things where it's it's all about setting stuff mm -hmm. up. By the way, I did build this. I'm I'm very proud of this right now. So mm -hmm. can I just show you one more thing? So mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. I I just got done doing this for my latest little YouTube video called uh, something about me making fun of JSON. So just just let it happen. But here we go. This is kind of a, a little bit of a spoiler. Uh, so anyways, I turn it into Zen mode. Uh, normally, I wouldn't have Tmux on, so this is all gone. Everything is gone, so it looks really, really smooth right now, right? It's just an editor. And so then I can go this whole Lua, and I can say, let's see how I can do, if I'm not mistaken, it is ghost. Yes, uh, not ghost. It's, sorry, I just, I just built this last night. I call it ghost line, and then I can say set the text to that that's my text i'm going to set it to carrot that 
and then I do this. Now it's perfectly clear, and I press leader TT and prints it yeah. out on the side as if it were executing it. So it looks really, really cool. So for YouTube videos, I can do, you know, I'll be able to do that. And every time I run it, then I have to redo it. So I can say, you know, Greg is awesome. And then I can also add another one, another line, and it will go through and give me most of it. it looks like I don't quite have it. Oh, then leader TT again. Boom, another line. Shazam. <laughs> so I can walk each line I put in there and have this nice little experience. I was going to also make it go all the way down in virtual text. So you see this really nice little thing. I don't know. It was something I'm little, you know, I'm working on, you know, make, uh, you know, some nice things. And I, you know, I, it just types Gosh. really nice. And maybe, you know, maybe I don't want it to be, uh, let's see, normal. Maybe I don't want it to be ghost text. So I can do a, uh, hold on, clear, get that out of here. I can set this and let's actually set it to, yeah, I can go like this, highlight that, do this and call and just say pluck. And it'll grab my previous highlighted region, which is that one. And now I can type it out as if it was code. Okay, everybody, <laughs> clap for the man. It is two weeks still until Valentine's Day, but he has already got his present for his wife. Look at that. Let's go. He's going to love it. Just make her a video. You're typing out messages I know, of it's, love. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. Oh, I could make a it's poem. Beautiful. And I could make say a poem, each poem. Man. Oh, my goodness. You don't even have to make the poem. If you made the Vim plugin that types it all out, she's going to be like... And then maybe, oh, I just got to get ChatGPT to write me a poem, and I could make the full circle. I could be like, babe, press a quick couple buttons, because obviously they, she wants to see the fingers move like I'm actually doing something magic on the keyboard here. And boom, line after line of sweet poetry about my wife, because I've seated a ChatGPT. I'm just saying, I do premarital counseling, and man, if somebody comes to me and he's like, I made a Vim plugin to type out poetry for my wife, it's like, yeah, let's get married. <laughs> Skip this the next is... four sessions. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, screw the premarital counseling. You've already done this. <laughs> this is getting dangerously close to arch user level romance. It is. It is getting really close. We got to be careful here. <laughs> next thing you know, I don't have kids anymore. Um, all right, this is fantastic. I, I don't. Do I have a work meeting? I don't even know what's happening anymore. Oh, but isn't I it nice how on topic we stayed, right? We actually did. So I would say we so did good. pretty good. This was a good time, Greg. You're great to have on here. You know, it's uh, it's great to have. Uh, people that can do camera work, you know, uh, I think that a lot of people in the tech world aren't great on the camera They don't have a good presence. You have a very good presence about you. You ask good questions and you answer very very well You know consider keep doing your YouTube love your updates love those things. Oh my gosh I know time time time. It's all about time, right? <laughs> but yeah, I know it's it's yeah. fun. We'll get to we'll get to doing some more of those I'm actually gonna do it I'm doing some code sandbox stuff for tutorials and I'm gonna try to do a YouTube video for each one of them eventually to put in the docs like for a, a little YouTube tutorial so if I had a million hours every day, it would all get done faster. I know. But you I know, know. <laughs> I swear it's 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 as if there was just <laughs> not quite enough time. I don't know what it is. It's just like it's just like, it's just so close. All right, Greg, what is your YouTube as well? Let's get your YouTube plugged oh, out there. Oh, well. I don't even know what is my YouTube. I don't even know what uh, is it. Uh, Greg J Johnston, right? Okay, well. How do I? GPJ there you go. There, I got you. I got you. Yeah, five hundred twelve subscribers, dude. Look at that, dude, People. That's a blessed number. I, look at that. People who just started YouTube and apparently only have two videos on, like that is it. That is their catalog. Would kill to have what you have. You've already, you're already doing a great job, Greg. Pro tip: They should just make a uh, web framework in like Go or something, uh, and then they'll get some subscribers. <laughs> That's true. Just make, yeah, just talk about TypeScript. Uh, I may, or, you may or may not have had your subscribers recently changed by at least one, because somebody within this area may or may not have been subscribed. But don't worry, we uh, we changed that. Okay. Well, it's at five hundred sixty now. So what the heck, guys? My my cool five hundred twelve. Let's get it to ten twenty four. I guess. Yeah, you you, ru you ruined the power of two, so we got to go from two, nine to ten. All right. That's the rule. Thank you very much. See Take care, Thank Gregory. Thank you so much. This was fun. Yep. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. I don't... Hold on. Bye. It's going to take me a moment to close it. Ah, there we go. We closed it. We got out of there. Let me hop back over here. Oh, no. Not there. There we go. Greg was still in there for a second. You see that? I didn't even realize I still had ping playing. Um, 623. Let's go. Hey, nice job, everybody. Uh, he's super nice guy. He obviously makes amazing software. Can I mean, if you haven't played with Leptos, something that's so incredible about Leptos is that he made a, a bunch of lightweight classes in which can be cloned. Yeah, he's a quality guy. 
And so these really clonable lightweight classes, or I call them classes, structs, structs, right? And that allows it to be super simple to program. So a lot of the problems about Rust, especially when it comes to this world, is like passing objects in and out of closures, being able to do this, being able to do that. Uh, hey, yeah, dude, he was a great interviewee. He's honestly the best. I, I really, I, there's a, there's some really easy people to talk 